All right, <clears throat> we're going to pick back up here in chapter 2 of Galatians. <clears throat> and <clears throat> he, we had just finished in verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2. Verse 3 starts by saying, neither, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me, God accepts no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. And notice how he's writing here. He's very, very blunt. And then he goes on and says, but in verse 7, But contrary was, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectual in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they under the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Well, so much for papal infallibility. Okay, anyway. <clears throat> he says, For before that certain came from James, we did, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Now, you can tell what he's doing here is he's showing, he's being very honest, very straightforward. But he's also saying, look, I know what I know. He said, these, these guys, I went and talked to them. They didn't add anything to me. They didn't fill up anything, you know, and he said, matter of fact, he said, uh, all they said was, you know, remember the poor. And he said, no, I was already doing that. So if you read really the real Paul, you'll see he, that he was very bold. He was very blunt. And he was, and he's defending his apostleship here saying, look, you have to understand, I know what, what Jesus told me. I know what he has given to me. Now, I want to go, well, yeah, let's go on down. On the page 69, in verse, I want to go to verse 19. He said, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now, I want to take you quickly to go to, yeah, go to Philippians. I'm sorry, to a section 14. It'll be on page 104, 104. Now he's in chapter 1, verse 1 here, it says, Paul and Timotheus, or Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet or right and, and useful for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. You hear that? Now, the reason he's telling them this is because this is the letter to the Philippians, and they were the only church that communicated with him and actually helped support him. And so he stayed in contact with them. And so, you know, I've heard this said before, and it really holds true, that this was the first partner letter 
that was ever written, all right? And because he's telling them how they are with him in this. And, and as a matter of fact, there's a lot of, of um, good statements in here that we will look at as we go along. But in verse 8, he says, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. In other words, in, in, in his inner being, he desired to be with them. There was a, a, a real um, earnestness about it. He says, In this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Notice, knowledge and judgment. That your love will abound. That you may approve things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, under the glory and praise of God. But I would ye should also understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. You understand, things happen, and you know, we know God's plans for us, but things can happen that the enemy plans for, for bad, and yet God can turn them around. But now notice, if God has to turn them around, then that means it wasn't God's plan for them in the beginning. You get that? And people say, well, but God planned it like this for this to happen for this reason. No, God turned it around. And the reason he turns things around, we know from Romans chapter 8, is because of mostly you praying in other tongues and the Spirit doing intercession for you, praying out the perfect will, but then you have to obey the will of God for that thing to be turned around. Right? The, the will of God is not always automatically done. If that were true, there's no way we could hear what Paul told Timothy when he said that, uh, you know, it's not God's will that any should perish but come to a, a, what we say is a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But yet people perish and don't come to a saving knowledge of Christ. So God's will is not always automatically done. That's why he gives us the gospel to preach. That's why it's important that we do our part, not that we get any glory from it in that sense, but that we are working, fellow workers, fellow co-laborers with Jesus Christ in accomplishing his will. He says, verse 13, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. In other words, they're seeing that I'm just, that I'm locked up, but I'm, nothing's happened to me. So now they're bold. They'll, they'll speak up now. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached? And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit. Now, this is a, a near direct uh, reference back to Romans chapter 8. That it is by us cooperating with the Holy Spirit and praying in other tongues that allows Him to work through us and to pray out the perfect will of God. And people say, but I don't understand what I'm saying. You don't have to. If you just feel like you have to, then you can always pray for the interpretation of it, but you don't have to know everything that's said. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I don't know. Now, look, at, look what he's saying here. Listen to how he's talking. He's in prison. He's in jail. Chained up. And he says, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I don't know. For I'm in a strait betwixt two. In other words, I'm in, I'm in a tough spot right now. I'm, I really don't know which way to go. I'm not sure what decision I'm going to make yet. But notice he says, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Do you see the way he's talking? He says, look, 
I, you know, God knows I'd really like to go on and be with Jesus. But right now it's better for you if I stay. So, okay, yeah, they're not going to kill me. And the whole time he's saying that he's chained between a Roman guard. And, and, and as we know, they think they have the power of life and death. But he said, no, nah, I'm making the decision. I don't know yet. You know, hey, I'd really like to go. It's looking pretty good. But I think I'll just hang around here a while because you need me. Anyway, and that's the spirit of dominion. You realize, look at his circumstances. But he wasn't subject to the circumstances. Amen? You get that? You can, and, and it's amazing how you look at different things. You look at uh, Paul and James in the early, or I'm sorry, uh, Peter and James in the early part of the book of Acts, or mid part of the book of Acts. And you see that here James is killed. And whenever Herod saw if that pleased the Jews, now he arrests Peter. And Peter goes to, uh, well, he's in prison and jailed up, chained up. And then an angel comes in and Peter's sleeping. James just got killed. Peter's probably going to be killed the next day, as far as anybody can tell. And he's sleeping. He's not even worried about it. Not staying up all night. He wasn't staying up all night praying. Right? He, he wasn't staying up all night. Oh, God, why has this happened to me? I've done everything like you told me. And, you know, I'm just, and he wasn't doing that. He was sleeping. And the angel actually had to come in and kick him, basically. You know, shake him to wake him up. And then the chains fall off. He walks out the front door. I mean, he just walks out. Why didn't that happen to James? You know why? Notice what Peter did. He went immediately to where the saints were gathered who had been praying for Peter the whole time for his release. There's not a word about them praying for James for his release. Isn't that something? Maybe they didn't take it seriously when he was arrested. Well, you know, the last time they arrested him, they... You know, whipped him and then let him go. Last time they just threatened him and let him go. Surely Herod wouldn't be stupid enough to kill him and make a martyr out of James. But then he does. So whenever they arrest Peter and ask, well, we better pray. See, I firmly believe, along with John Wesley, that really there's not much God can do in this earth until he first get a man to pray or a woman to pray, a person. That's why it's so vital that we pray. And, that, and we don't just pray little prayers. We don't pray to pray. We actually pray. Like Dr. Summerall told me that time when I was hiding behind that pillar. He said, you're going to hide over there in the shadows? You're going to come out here and pray. And I went out there and started praying little prayers. And finally he just stopped. almost ran into him. He said, you're going to pray? Pray! You know, one minute I'm standing there kind of like, Father, in Jesus' name, we just pray. Pray! Oh, God! God! <laughs> You know, I mean, well, I mean, he, he had a way of just stirring you up because if you didn't, he'd be liable to hit you. <laughs> I mean, he just never knew what he was going to do. <laughs> Nobody ever saw him hit anybody, but we knew he'd been around Wigglesworth a lot, so we wasn't sure he wouldn't do it. <laughs> so, but, but you think about this situation. We look at these different situations that go on, and now here you've got James is killed. Peter is in prison, but now he's loose. And when they, then when he comes up, and this shows us something too, because when he comes up to the gate, knocks on the door, the girl goes to the gate and then doesn't even open it. <laughs> Runs back in and says, it's Peter's angel. What made her think that? Well, the Jews thought that their angels often took on the shape of the person, and they thought it was his angel. And, that, and, it, and it's a, it was a common belief that the guardian angel, so to speak, of a person would look like the person. Which also, there's been situations, even, uh, well, we've had people write to us. I had one person write not too long ago and said, uh, wrote to the office here and sent a, a letter in the P.O. box and said, we want to thank Brother Curry for coming out and teaching our life team for two weeks. I ain't never been there. No, I'm serious. I, I got, I'm thinking, where is this? It was in California. And they, I'd never been there. And they said, I stood in their living room and talked for two weeks. I have no explanation for that. It makes no sense. I didn't feel anything. I, you know, it's, I, don't, I don't know. You know, I'm thinking, okay, maybe, maybe my angel was out there too. I don't, I don't know. But I mean, they hadn't even requested me to be there, but we get this letter. So weird stuff like that happens at times. 
right? Why? Maybe it's because things need to happen. So, but, you know, it's amazing how many people want to sit around and talk about it, and they'd rather tell testimonies than actually live the life. Right? Paul said the same thing at one point, as I read it a while ago. He, would even, he even said, listen, I'm not there in the flesh, but I am there in the spirit. Beholding your order, watching what you're doing, seeing your love for the saints. I'm there watching you, even though I'm not there. How does that happen? By the spirit. This is what is called... Uh, well, actually, they used to call it in the old days, they called it the higher life or the deeper life. It's funny, you know, depending on who you talk to. But it was talking about walking in the things of the Spirit. There's people that, even Dr. Summerall, you know, when we used to uh, <clears throat> listen to him talk about some of the things that he had been through, there were things that he experienced that made no sense. You ever notice there's so many things in the Bible that don't make sense of why they happen that way, but they still happen. And you think, why did you include that? Probably because it's just weird. I mean, it was just one of those strange things, and it's like, hmm, okay. But if you, I'll give you an example. Ephesians 3.20. Let's look at it real quick. I'll give you just a real quick example here. In Ephesians 3.20. He says, <clears throat> let's go back to, yeah. We'll look at about, well, okay. It's all so good. Okay. We'll start in verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. You got that? The whole family in heaven and earth in heaven is known. The whole family of Jesus is known in heaven as the family of Jesus. Rather, right? Jesus Christ would be... The whole family. But now notice, he says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant. Now, you realize if you're named after the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus is your name too. Just like a woman takes her husband's name and becomes her name, the name of Jesus isn't just a name you use. It's your name now because you're in him. It's no longer you that live, but Christ who lives in you. Do you get that? So it's the same name, and it's your name to use. You don't have to ask permission to use it. It's given to you. Okay? That he would grant you. Now we're in verse 16. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. You hear that? That's, that's your inner man. That's your spirit. That you would be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Then he says that Christ may dwell in you, in your hearts, by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Now stop right there. Two things. The word know in the beginning there is a Greek word. It's epignosis, and it means to know a fullness in an experiential way. To not just know about it, but to experience it and to know it fully. Okay? To know, and get this, the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Now how can you know that which passes knowledge? See, that, that's a knowing, not a knowing. See, you can't understand here unless this is totally renewed, which Paul knew they weren't. But unless this is totally renewed, you couldn't, you couldn't fathom it. But you can know it. You can know the reality of it. Now watch this. <clears throat> and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Now it gets good. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Hear that? What does it say about Jesus? That all the fullness of God dwelt what? Bodily in him. Isn't that right? Dwelt in him bodily. In Christ, all of the fullness. Of God. So what does it look like to walk in all the fullness of God? It looks like Jesus. And right here we're told his desire is that we would know the love of Christ which passes knowledge and, and that all the fullness of God might dwell in you. Now think about it. Imagine if you started saying, all the fullness of God dwells in me. Okay, first off, yeah, religious people are going to get really mad. Right? They're going to think you've gone off the deep end. 
and they're going to think you've done gone crazy, or they'll say, well, who do you think you are? Okay. People that say, who do you think you are, always are dealing with guilt and condemnation. Every time. Why? Because they're always, what they're really saying is, why do you think you're better than me? That's what they're saying. And you have to realize, it's not that anybody thinks they're better than anybody. But we have to know who we are. Right? And if you truly know who you are, you'll never think you're better than anybody. Because you'll know it's the same blood that was paid for both of you. So he says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now stop right there. That's not the end of it. We'll stop there. To him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. Think about that. Not just above what we can ask or think, but exceeding abundantly above what we can ask or think. Now let me ask you this. How do you think you could pray a prayer above what you can ask or think because you got you to gotta think before you can ask? Right? And here he says that God can do exceeding abundantly even beyond what you can ask or think. And yet we in the church think that we have to ask perfectly in the exact right manner, the exact right words, and we have to get it all straight. And if that's true, if you think you have to get it all straight before you can ever pray right and get an answer, you will never see Ephesians 3.20 filled in you. Why? Because he says he can do there exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. So if you can ask or think, so far, you're just up to what you can ask or think. Amen? Let me give you some examples. And if you've heard the DHT, I use these same examples because they just illustrate it well. <clears throat> but I was in uh, Kilmarnock, uh, Virginia, which is right on the tip. I mean, there's water out there, more water than land. Right? And we were out there. We were there for a week. We go in. There's no phone service. There's nothing there. Uh, I mean, it was rough. Right? Because, I mean, my phone was... At that time, I could get 30 messages on my phone and be filled. And I was, before that week, before I got there, I was having to empty, listen to it, write them down, and empty my voicemail at least three to four to five times a day. <clears throat> and so I go into Kilmarnock. I'm there for a week. As soon as I get into the, that area, I got no phone service. Now, that really bugs me because people call me when they're about to die. And so now I'm in the middle of teaching a DHT. I got no phone service. And then I start to leave. <clears throat> That's another place. Uh, <laughs> just thinking about South Korea just now. But that was another place. When I got there that whole week, it's supposed to be raining. And, and we told them we got there because we, we knew it didn't need to rain because then nobody would come to the meetings. And I said, when we got there, I said, it won't be raining when we get there. They, they said, well, we hope people show up because it's supposed to rain all week. I said, it won't rain as long as I'm there. I said, whenever we finish, then it can rain. And so that whole week, everybody's going outside looking around, pretty blue skies, everything's great. It did get gray a lot, but it never rained. And then finally, the day we left, that Sunday, <clears throat> actually it was Monday morning, when we were driving out, I'm trying to get phone service, you know, driving down the road, and literally we passed the city limits and we saw three water drops hit my windshield. And then a few, I called the pastor and I said, uh, I was going to let you know rain's on its way. <laughs> and he said, yeah, it just started hitting here too. And for the next three days, it rained straight. Amen. It wasn't bad. It was like it should be. But we've seen that over and over. The same thing happened with South Korea when we were there. It's, uh, the weather changed exactly the opposite. Okay? It was <clears throat> warm here. It was cold there. When we got there, it warmed up and got cold here. We came back here, it warmed up. It's cooled off a little bit now, but it's still... Uh, when we were there, they were... <clears throat> the guy said, I don't know what to do. He said, this is supposed to be our winter. He says, it's like spring. He says, got everybody, everybody's confused. <laughs> and then we started to leave. And because they'd heard some of the stories, we started to leave on the way out. And he said, uh, I, don't, I don't get this. Uh, it's, it's, he said, this isn't fair. <laughs> and I said, what? He said, look, on, on the weather, uh, starting tomorrow, it's supposed to be raining and snowing. And it's supposed to drop. The day before we got there was the coldest they'd had all year. The day we got there, it warmed up 30 degrees. Warmed up, right? So it just goes back and forth. And then we start to leave. We see a few little drops. We're on the way to the airport. See a few little snowflakes. And he looked at it and he goes, that's just not fair. That's just not fair. <laughs> he said, now you're going to leave and I've got to shovel snow. And he said, why don't you stay a couple more weeks? So <laughs> but he, was, he kept going on about that quite a bit. So, <clears throat> but 
I'm, I'm coming out, I'm trying to get a phone service, and finally it picks up, and all of a sudden all these messages start coming in, and I start listening to it, and it's like the third or fourth one, it's this message, emerg an emergency message. Brother Curry, please pray. They're taking so-and-so to the hospital. Don't expect them to live. Please pray. This was a week ago. Now I hear that, and I'm like, oh, great. Because most people that call me, they don't call other people. They expect me to get the job done. And so then I, I go on through, I'm listening to other messages, and like number 27, 28, this guy's calling. He goes, Brother Curry, just want to let you know, praise God, thank you for praying, because uh, he's going home, everything's going to be okay. Well, now I feel really bad. You know, because now we're kind of getting credited for something that we didn't do. <clears throat> and and I'm, I'm driving, and I'm feeling bad about it, and I'm praying about it. And, and God says, whenever <laughs> he told me, he said, uh, that's all right. He said, I healed him because you got credit with me. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I, I'm like, credit? Okay. He said, yeah, because I know if you'd have got that message, you'd have prayed, and he would have lived. So I went ahead and healed him on the basis that you would have prayed. And I said, okay, I need scripture. Believe it, I mean, you know, you want scripture, right? You want to make sure it's the right voice talking to you. I said, I need scripture. And he took me to scripture and said, before they call, I will answer. Amen. Amen. And so after that, I said, okay, that's good. So I decided from then on, I don't even have to pray about weather. I expect it. I expect certain things, right? Expectation is a higher form of faith, right? If you always believe that you have to pray and believe, that's a lower form. You expect if you have to pray and if you always have to pray and believe for everything, then you're going to miss some things that you forget to pray about, and you're going to end up going without, or somebody else is. But if you learn to expect, then God will start meeting your needs even before you ask. Amen. God is so much bigger and wants to do so much more in you, through you, and for you than you can possibly imagine. Possibly imagine. But we we relegate him to religion. We relegate him to our creed. You know, well, this is how we do things. Well, we need to find out how he does things. Yes. Amen? Amen? And let him be God. Let him show off a little bit. Let him do things unexpectedly. Amen? Because here he says, unto him that is able to do exceeding, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. I mean, when was the last, thing, last time God did something above what you even thought about? See, that's, that's when I told you about the the, the, the television thing. Whenever uh, the, the, the big check came in and we had to have it and it all came in. That was, I wasn't even at that point thinking about it. I wouldn't, I'll be honest with you, I can't even say I prayed about it. Why? Because it's his deal. Right? He knows I didn't want it. It's his deal. And if he wants it to run, then he's going to do it. So I expect it to be done. I, I expect him to meet the needs that are there. And so, but he says here, above all that we ask or think. Now, how does that work? Here's, the, here's the, the, the condition. According to the power that works in us. Not according to the power that dwells in you. The power that's working in you. See, the power that dwells in you is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the ultimate power. There's, there's no limit to the power that, it, that lives in, that dwells in you. The limit is the power that's working in you, which is what you know he can do from what you've seen, and then trusting him to do even beyond that. Because we had not seen anything yet. Okay, you know, we can talk about different things, but I'm telling you, nobody has truly seen greater works than what Jesus did. We've seen some amazing things. One of them, which is a, a good, I mean, nowadays we don't even think anything about it. But I remember, where was I at? Um... I don't know why I was at here. Maybe. Well, anyway, you don't care. Anyway, so, but I was, I was sitting at a stoplight one day and my phone rang and I picked up an answer. It was a person in Australia and they were praying for, they were calling to ask for prayer. And while I'm sitting at a traffic light, it's red, I'm sitting there and I pray and this person is healed. And they're like, I, I, can, I can do it. I can stand, I can walk, I can move, I can do this. And they got healed sitting at a, at a traffic light. Okay, why? I, I didn't have to go off and pray and fast and wait for the power. It was according to the power that works in you. The power that's working in you is the power that you stir up. It's the power that is in there that you're living by. You understand that? It's not, okay, let me put this. Man does not live by bread alone, but by what? 
every word that what? Proceeds from the mouth of God. Isn't that right? All right, now let's, let's look at that. What does that mean? Because what that says is man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, here's the thing. There is nobody in this room that is living by every word that is proceeded from the mouth of God. You got that? If you did, you'd be walking like Jesus. Right? So, now notice, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. What word do you live by? It's the word you practice. The word you live by is the word you do. Right? There's a whole bunch in here that you're not doing. Right? But you're living by the ones you do. But we are supposed to live by every word. We're supposed to fulfill every word of this. Jesus said, I don't judge you. He said, but you have one that will judge you in that day. And he said, the word that I've spoken unto you, that'll be your judge. You hear that? You're going to be judged according to his word. That's what you're going to be judged by. He said, oh, judgment's passed away. Judgment for sin. In that sense that, that he's not, you're not going to be going through the same judgment that sinners go through. Right? But, according, but your works, your rewards are going to be judged according to how you lived out his word. You're not going to be able to say, well, I didn't know. Well, my church didn't teach that. He's going to say, well, my church does. <laughs> right? Why did you stay in that church? There has to be a point where you say, all right, every word. <clears throat> now, the thing is, you have to remember, God is never going to ask you to do what you can do. He's always going to ask you to do what you can't do. Because he'll, he will ask you to do as much as you can do, but then that's going to stop short of what he wants you to do. He expects us to put forth the effort, but he also expects us to trust him. So he'll never ask you to do what you can do. He will always ask you to do what you can't do. But why? Because you'll have to trust him. That's why. That's how you do the impossible. It's only impossible to you until you decide to do it. It's not impossible to God, right? Nothing impossible to him. But you have to decide. So you live by this word. So there comes a point when he says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. When you do that and you, you start to live by it, it becomes a, not just a way of life, but a rule to live by. Does that make sense to you? It's not, a, you know, it's not like a law in the sense of, well, let's go find it in the law. We're not talking about that. But it's a, and, and even Paul talked about the law in our members. That's the law we live by. That's the rules we live by. So it's important that we understand what the Word of God says. Now, you can know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, right? And then he says, <clears throat> if you do that, until you know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, you can't be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, but when you're filled with the fullness of God, now he can do exceeding abundantly above all you are able to ask or think. Why? According to the power that's working in you. What is that power? The power of the Holy Spirit. It's actually the power of the Holy Spirit mixed with the power of faith. See, it's not just the power of the Holy Spirit. If it was just the power of the Holy Spirit, all this stuff would be happening without any effort on your... That's why I, I was actually just in the back during these breaks I, I'm writing up some, some teachings, you would say. <clears throat> and I was talking about the... Or in this thing I was writing, I was talking about the practice of faith. And I was talking about the journey of faith and, and the walk of faith. And one thing that people don't realize is that one of the key components of faith is, is knowing, but not knowing. See, if, if, if you know, if you can look and say, okay, this is how God's going to do it, then there's no faith involved. Abraham left not knowing where he was going, right? But you have to be able to say, Here, here's what I know. I know that when it's over with, it will look like this. Now, how it gets from the way it looks now to looking like that, I don't know. All I know is when it's done, it will look like that. Right? And that's exactly what he said about faith. That's what he said about the kingdom. <clears throat> that's what he said about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, nobody knows where it comes from, where it goes. It, it just, it's just like the wind in the trees. It blows through. And he said, <clears throat> nobody knows how faith grows. It's like a seed planted. Nobody knows how the kingdom expands. It's like a seed planted. Night and day it works. How it works, we don't know, but it just grows. So, but the bottom line is when you plant a seed, what are you picturing? The seed or the grown thing? Well, you're, you're picturing the crop, right? So when you plant the seed, you're not thinking of the seed. You're thinking of the, the finished product. That's what faith does. <clears throat> and faith usually, honestly, 
If it's not impossible, it's probably not in faith. Because if, if, if you can do it, why do you need faith to do it? Yeah. You need faith for what you can't do. And faith doesn't know. The, 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 it's, it's this real strange thing, this balance to where you know, you know, because it, it's your faith. Your faith in God, you know this is the way it's going to be. Other people may look at you and go, I don't see how that's going to happen. And you might look and go, I don't know how it's going to happen either. All I know is it's going to happen. That's faith. See, most people won't go that route. Most people don't want to put their reputation on the line. They don't want to step out. They don't want to say these things. They'd rather, well, let's just do it. And when it works, we'll tell everybody about it. It doesn't work that way. Right? So you have to, and, and with faith, there always has to be the possibility of absolute, utter destruction. Okay? Doesn't that sound fun? What that means, or I should even say, absolute, utter failure. When you're walking in faith, there, there is that element that if, if this doesn't work, it's all going to fall apart. If this doesn't work, we're in big trouble. But we don't have to think about that. Why? Because it's going to work. And the person says that. Say, person looks at it and goes, man, if this doesn't work, we're in trouble. Okay. The other person looks and says, yeah, but it's going to work, so we don't have to worry about it. Okay, that's the person with the faith. You see? Now, is there a, for it to be faith, there always has to be that possibility of failure. But when you're in faith, there's no possibility of failure. You see, it's only, it only looks like there's a possibility to people that don't have faith. Yeah. And the beauty of it is, you don't have to wait. You can choose to have faith. Right? Hebrews 11 tells us, <clears throat> Moses, by faith, chose to suffer with the children of Israel rather than to stay in the palace and all the splendor and all the pleasures there in the palace. Yeah. Why? <clears throat> by faith, he chose. Faith is a choice. You can choose to walk in faith, right? Now, you're not going to choose to walk in faith and spend all your time with your face stuck in a TV somewhere unless you're watching some faith-building program, right? You're not going to do it by watching this or that movie necessarily. You're going to have to get in the Word and you're going to have to abide in Him and His Word abide in you and then you can ask whatever you will and He'll have it. <clears throat> and then the biggest thing is you're going to have to deal with people that are telling you it ain't working. And, there, and be ready for it. Everybody. Listen, when you start to stand in faith, most people are not going to stand with you. They'll run off and hide until it comes through, and then they'll all join around you and say, I knew you could do it. <laughs> yeah, I was with you the whole time. I was right behind you. Well, you were behind me, but you were way back there. <laughs> I couldn't even see you, right? So you, you have to realize that that's the difference that when, when you're in faith... And, and I'm not saying you're not going to have the idea of, well, you know, what if it, what if it didn't work? Well, yeah, you, you count the cost. That's part of faith is counting the cost. But you don't look at all the negative side of what if it don't work. You're looking at, but man, when it works, oh, that's going to be good. It's going to be awesome. God's going to be so glorified. This is going to be something good. And so, but I'll tell you, the easy, let me tell you the easiest thing you could have faith for. Anything that doesn't involve you. I'm telling you, right? It, it, it's only hard when it involves you, right? If you want to have, let me tell you, you, you could, I could list up a name, of, a list of names of orphanages <clears throat> and you could start saying, yeah, I'm going to support that and, and I'm going to give a million dollars toward that, $10 at a time, <laughs> right? And you would have faith for that and you could reach for that. Why? Because it's for them. But if, if you said, uh, but now I need this money or I need this thing or I need God to do this thing for me. And now I said, well, I don't know. No, it's much easier to have faith for big projects that don't have anything to do with you. Yeah. Every one of you ought to be supporting an orphanage somewhere. Amen. <laughs> well, that was a resounding silence. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it ought, it ought to be easy <clears throat> for you to have faith for God to feed orphans. Come on. Be, uh, okay, listen, I'm not going to get you to sign up to support an orphanage, so relax, okay? We, we already received the offering, haven't we? Did we already receive the offering? Oh, that's good. Now I know that I'm not, you know I'm not pulling on you, right? <clears throat> so, I mean, if we hadn't received the offering, then you'd think I was setting you up for something. I'm, I'm not doing that. I don't do that. Usually, if I start talking about money before the offering, I tell them not to take up the offering. Why? Because I don't want you to think I'm pulling. See, so you set boundaries. Trust God. 
Yeah, I'll tell you real quick here too, because <clears throat> he says here, yeah. Yeah, we got that. Okay. Um, when you, okay. <clears throat> Get that to work. <laughs> there, <laughs> we got it. <clears throat> if you're going to walk in faith with, to any real degree, you're going to have to decide who you're going to hang around with. See, for me, let me tell you, the best thing I ever did for, for my spiritual life in that sense, I was in Houston, Texas at John Osteen's church, Lakewood, back before Joel, John's dad. And I was there, it was 1982, I think, 82? 82, yeah, I think it was. And if we were at the church during the day and at night we were over at, I think it was Sam Houston Coliseum or something like that. It was the same place where um, William Branham had the picture taken where he had the thing over the light over his head. If you ever saw that. Anyway, um, <clears throat> we were there. Everybody was there. Everybody. Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Norval Hayes, Hilton Sutton, if you remember all these old names, but they were all there. And <clears throat> there was a minister's meeting, and some of you probably heard this, but I went into it. I wasn't a minister at the time. I was not ordained or licensed or anything else. I knew God called me. That's all I knew. I was studying. I was doing everything I knew to do. But nobody, I knew I was called. Nobody else did. Right? And so I'm there, and, I, and they have a minister's meeting. You're supposed to be a minister to go in there. And I snuck in. Okay? I just went in, sat down, quiet, not trying to draw attention. And they had everybody up on the platform, and they had a table there, and they were all there. And it looked like the Lord's Supper. You know, you had them all spread out, looked just like the picture of the Lord's Supper. And people were asking questions. They'd raise their hands, stand up, say who they were, where they were from, and then they would ask a question of somebody on that panel, which include, included Dr. Summerall, uh, everybody. Everybody was there. So everybody goes through all this, and it's kind of winding down, and I, they're about finished. So I figured I might as well take a chance. If they kick me out, it's the last 10 minutes. I'm not going to miss anything anyway, so might as well take a chance. So I raised my hand. They called me. I stood up, told them who I was, told them where I was from, and then I said, and this question is for Dr. Summerall. And I asked him a certain question. And then he said, when, when he answered it, and then uh, as I sat down, he said, uh, how soon can you get to South Bend, Indiana? I said, as soon as I get home, I'll, I'll, I'll come. All right, when you get there, come see me. Okay. And there, I had nothing up there. Well, I had nothing back home either, so it didn't matter. But, you know, so, then, you know, it's not like I gave up a lot, you know what I'm saying? But... I went out into the other main meeting. Two things happened. One is when I went out, I found my wife. She was, there was a big crowd, and everybody had moved forward toward the platform because there was a, uh, I remember he was a red-headed Irish preacher. I still don't remember his name, but he, he was a missionary. It was awesome what he was saying, what I walked up into. And so I told my wife, I said, I, you know, I was trying to be quiet. I'm like, I'm going to South Bend. And she said, what's in South Bend? And I said, Dr. Summerall. She said, what, what about it? He, she said, why are you going? I said, he told me to come. Why? I don't know. He just told me to come. Why did he tell you to come? I don't know. How are you going to get there? I don't know. I didn't have a car. We, we rode down with my parents, right? And so, because my, my car was a piece of junk, and it, to, to tell everybody, I paid $500 for it, and I got ripped off. <laughs> okay? It, just, it was bad, okay? It was bad. So I didn't, because it, it broke down real quick. And so, <clears throat> so we rode down with my parents. And it's funny because this guy, this, and I just told him, I'm going to South Bend. And my wife said, okay, you know, I, we don't, we didn't know any details yet. And so about that time, this uh, missionary said, if you have received a missionary call on your life, come forward. And so a lot of people went forward. And I'm, I'm standing there and I'm like, I know I'm supposed to be going into all the world. So somewhat of a missionary. I didn't know if I'd be, where I'd be living or anything, so I, I kind of moved up. And I didn't know, but my mom and dad were there, but my dad uh, was by the chairs where we were, and my mom had moved forward because as a child, my mom, when she was uh, six weeks old, uh, she had major surgery where they had to remove, like, you know, a, a large part of her intestine. And they didn't think she'd make it. And my grandmother had a bunch of, um, well, I had a bunch of other children. There was five, six, five or six of them. And so 
<clears throat> my grandmother um, was a person of rather weak constitution. Uh, I'm not trying to be mean. It's just she was a real nervous type, and she couldn't handle a lot. And so probably because she had five kids, actually. I, I never thought of that before, but that's <laughs> probably what it was. Uh, so, but regardless, um, she knew she couldn't raise my mom, and they couldn't take care of her. The way. So they literally gave my mom to a very close friend, not really a relative, but she was known as Aunt so-and-so. But she wasn't really relative. But she gave her, she, they gave her to this woman to raise. And they lived close, so they'd see her. I mean, it wasn't like they was far off. Anyway, um, as my mother uh, grew, uh, there was a, a woman evangelist that came through when my mom was about 13, 14 years old. And this evangelist said, you know, could you, would you like to travel with me? So my mom traveled with her uh, for about a year or so and then came back home and then met my dad. And then they got married and then I was born the next year. And so, <clears throat> but my mom knew that she was called to be a missionary. But she, back then, especially because she got married, she felt, that's that, I can't do that. And so, as a child, I didn't even know this. But she had turned around and said, I can't be a missionary, but God, my son can, and so let him go in my stead. So I didn't know all that until here we are standing in this deal, and my mom's standing in front of me. I didn't even recognize she was standing in front of me, which is kind of unusual because my mom has... Long red hair. She's 75, something like that now. Yeah, 75, 75. And, but her hair is still real long and red. It's still red, right? No gray, nothing. It's still red hair. And so she was standing in front of me, and this guy, this missionary, pointed her out and said, Ma'am, you, right there. God has said that you felt the call to missions as a child, but you couldn't go, so you passed it to your son. Where is your son? And she didn't know I was standing behind her. Oh, wow. So she turned a point and almost hit me in the face. It was kind of like, because <laughs> she thought I was still in the minister's meeting. And so then they called us and me and her went to the front and he prayed over us and all this stuff. So and right after Dr. Summerall has said, come to South Bend. Wow. So all of that was one event, right? And so believe me, our ride back home was really interesting. We had lots of talk. And so we went back up, came back up to North Texas. And while we were there, I didn't know what to do. All I knew is I had to go to South Bend. So I had my wife. We had uh, three children at that point. And so my sister-in-law was there. And my sister-in-law, um, well, I'll just put it this way. I, I, told, I told my wife, you need to stay with your sister. And I'll go to South Bend. I'll get a job. And I'll come back and get you. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have money enough to get on a bus. My parents bought my bus ticket. Right? So I get on this bus and I ride three days and then I get to South Bend. Then they put me on a city bus that takes me out to 530 Ireland Road, which is Dr. Summerall's church. And I got off at the front, had my duffel bag, had my suitcase with me. And I go in the front and when I walk in and that's how I got to South Bend. Well, I didn't know what to expect. I, I didn't go up there looking for a job, you know, for, from him. I, went up there, I got two other jobs. One was detasseling corn, which is a horrible job. I hope you never have to do that. Okay. <laughs> cut my finger. No, he told me I needed gloves. So, I, man, I cut my fingers up trying to detassel the top of that corn. And so and it was cold and rain. Oh, poor me. Poor me. <laughs> 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 no, no. <laughs> Do you feel it? No, no. <laughs> but I'm doing that and then I got a, a job at fast food. And all I told him was, you know, I, I don't care what hours I work. All I know is when the church is open, I'm going to be there. And so, and if I don't get those days off, I'll quit. I'll find something else. But I, I came here for that. I didn't come here for a job. So I got those, both of those jobs, actually, and then was there every time the doors open. And so I started hanging out there and been around Dr. Summerall as much as I possibly could. And then I saved up some money, and I got an apartment. I stayed with a family there in the church until I got an apartment, which was, it didn't take that long. And so I got the, the apartment, and then uh, there was a young man, uh, African, that was there from Soweto in South Africa. And he was in the Bible school there. And I told him, I said, you want to go preach in Texas? He said, sure, let's go. And I was like, great. While we're there, we can pick up my wife and kids. <laughs> <laughs> and so I still didn't have a car at that point, right? And he did. So we were good buddies. So we drove down. And I got a 
hurry. I got to send John a break. But I, I drove down uh, with him. We got down here, and my mom had set up a place for us to preach in a town just near here named Longview, a couple of hours away from here. And it was a very, I didn't know that. I didn't know they were racist. But I found out when we got there. Okay? Because they just heard I was bringing somebody down with, to preach with me. They did, they did, we didn't specify the color of his skin. And so we get there, we walk in, me, my wife, and him, we walk in, we sit down, and we realize after a while, they're not going to call us up to preach. I mean, they just keep on preaching, sing, or talking, singing, taking up the offering. I mean, they're all this stuff. And I'm like, it never takes this long. Wow. And so finally the pastor gets up, he starts, you can tell he's kind of preaching, but not trying to act like he's not preaching. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so we were sitting right near the restrooms, which is a little hallway. And so we, I, I'm like, let's, let's go in there and talk. So we all get up go in the hallway. We're like, I don't think they're going to let us preach. And he's like, no, they're not. He said, it's, he said, you, do you notice there's no one else here that's black? And I'm like, I hadn't noticed. You know, because I didn't think that way. Right. And so <clears throat> I said, well, let's go. And he's like, and my wife's like, I don't want to go back out across there, you know, about right through everybody because we got to walk right past everybody. And so we were right there at the restrooms. And so I opened the restroom door and I said, there's a window. So, yeah. <laughs> so all three of us crawled out a window. <laughs> right? <laughs> I broke out of church. That's exactly right. I broke out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we crawled out of a window, right? I had to go first so that I could help my wife and she came, and then she came through and then the, the young man with his wizard, he came out and we go get in the car. And I, I always wondered, because I've never been back. I always wondered how long they waited for us to come out of the bathroom before they actually sent somebody in to check on us, you know? Or they wonder if we were translated or whatever it was. <clears throat> but I lo we loaded up the kids, we loaded up what little things we had, and we went back to South Bend, and again, I was working there, and so we had an apartment, then uh, I got this really, again, a bad car uh, that was is all I could afford, and then uh, we took on the prayer line for Dr. Sumrall, and all we could, we could do the 11 o'clock, because nobody else wanted it. And so we took on 11 at night till 7 in the morning answering prayer calls. First time I'd ever prayed for anybody over the phone that people got healed. And so we started writing all stuff down. Well, then we missed a night because my car broke down. And Dr. Sumrall, you know, we're there when he gets there. And he, he looks and goes, where were you last night? <laughs> oh, Dr. Sumrall, I'm sorry. Our car broke down. We couldn't. Uh-huh. And I'm like, ooh, that doesn't sound good. You know? <laughs> and Brother Murphy, which was his brother-in-law, was standing next to him. And he turned around and he goes, Get this young couple a car by five o'clock, and I don't mean maybe. Oh. Turned and walked off, and I'm like, Yeah, yeah. Get me a car by five o'clock. You know, that's, you know. Well, I wish he'd have said by two or three days, because then he would have had time to look for a good one. So we just got one real quick, all right? But we got that car, and we were able to get back and forth, and we were there uh, for several years with Dr. Sumrall. But Here's, here's the point. I, really, there was a point. Okay? And, and this is it. Okay? It was the best choice I ever made, but I had nothing. I had no proof. I could have went up there and fell flat on my face. I could have went up there and nothing happened. Yeah. But it was the best time of my growth because I got to watch him just minister and just be him. And he was a pastor and he was traveling and he was doing all these different things. And I got to, and all the video, we got all his videos and stuff. And the other day I was watching one of his videos because I'll put them on from time to time. I still miss him, still wish he was around, would love to be able to say, you know, you didn't waste your time. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, this is what's coming out of it. And I'm sure he knows, but I put on a video to watch him. And he said, I was down in Texas the other day and this uh, young minister from, from Texas asked me this question. And I'm like, and, and he goes, I'm like, that's my question. And I'm like, he didn't know my name. He didn't mention my name, but that's my question. Yeah, yeah. And I was a young minister from Texas. I said, he's talking about me. I never knew he mentioned it. But, he, but the, it wasn't because he was saying, oh, you know, look up this young minister. He wasn't saying that. He was saying, and it was probably a stupid question, but, it, <laughs> but here it was, you know. So he, but he answered the question. And I'm like, that was my question. I never knew it was on tape. And so, but we got to hear that later on, you know, just the other day, actually. And here it's been 30 years now. But you, you watch these things. And, but the point is, it wasn't wasted. I took a chance. Everybody thought I was crazy. Everybody thought, this is ridiculous. 
You don't need to go all the way up there. Whatever God can do for you there, He can do for you here. Let me tell you, Moses had to turn aside and go see the burning bush. What if he had said, huh, we're going this way. God, if God wants me, he can do it for me right here. I don't have to go over there. He, can do it. Well, he would have never been the deliverer he was called to be. So we have to sometimes turn aside from our plans, sometimes turn aside from our goals, what we want, and actually to actually go out of our way. Dr. Sumrall used to say, if there's anything God's doing anywhere, I'm going to go be right in the middle of it. Whenever Pensacola broke out, we went. We went several times down there, and God blessed us because of it. And so the, the, the thing is, yes, God can bless you where you are. Yes, he can talk to you. He can do things for you. But he also, there's times when he wants to see just how bad do you want it. Whenever he told Abraham, he said, I want you to offer up your only son. He, he didn't, when they started on the road, he didn't, he didn't say, okay, Abraham, I see you're serious. No, no, he waited until he pulled that knife up. Then he said, now I know that you fear me and you'll obey what I tell you to do. See, there are times when God waits that last second just to see how serious you are. See, this isn't popular theology today, but it's Bible. And so we went up there and I'm telling you, it was, that, that is, if there was one part of my life that I know guaranteed that I was in the will of God and yet it looked like nothing the way people think it should look. And yet, we saw God move in our lives. We saw things happen. And, and I got things there I didn't even know I got until years later when I'd open my mouth and Dr. Summerall would come out. And I'd stop and I'd go, glory to God, that was Dr. Summerall. I don't know if y'all know that or not. That was Dr. Summerall, you know? And I didn't even know I got that when I was there. But there are things sometimes you have to go after. But if there's not a chance for utter failure, because that could have been a big, big problem. People say, oh, look, he left his wife, went up there. And did. I, didn't, I didn't leave her. I told her I was coming back for her. Right? I told my wife a long time ago, I'm going to follow God no matter what. And if you don't go with me, I'm not leaving you. It's you not going. <laughs> and I, and I'm going to follow God. God has dibs on my life before I ever met you. I said, he called me from before I was even a child, before I was even born. I said, God has plans for my life. And I said, and they're bigger than this little hole in the wall town we were in. I don't know what they are, but I told her, you stick with me. Uh, when I proposed to her on a dirt road up in Howe, Texas, I said, you stick with me. I said, we'll go around the world. I said, you'll know people on every continent because God's got a bigger plan for my life than this little town. And I, had no, I didn't know anything about John Lake. I didn't know anything about anything, any of that stuff. I didn't know how God, I just knew in me was bigger than that little town. And then, then God starts to unveil it. But I had to go after it first. God wants to know. How serious are you? How, how much do you want it? Amen? Amen. Well, it is 4.30. Okay. Uh, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. All right. We can, yeah, just change whatever you got to change back there. <laughs> I don't know if you need to set the timer again. I didn't do any good last time. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, now if you, uh, yeah, if you need to go to the restroom or something, you know, feel free. We don't lock the doors. You're, you're free to go. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Hadn't always been that way. Let me tell you. <laughs> I got invited to a lot of churches one time, you know. Just, you know so, but, so let's get back in here because I want you to, I, I just want you to see that faith has a risk to it. Faith is a choice. You have to make that choice. Every choice is a choice for God or against God. Every choice, no matter what it is. And you're constantly making those choices. So make choices for God. Go I don't want to just say go the hard way. I mean, usually the hard way is the right way. But just go after God. Make that choice. Make the decision. Once you make the choice, don't back off of it. The devil will give you every reason to back off. He will try to get you to do everything to back off. Don't back off. Dig in deeper. Amen? I mean, make it, make it big. It's like I you know, was telling you the other day about the television stuff. And they said, we got an opportunity here. Hey, okay, let's go. You know, let's go bigger. Well, what if it fails? We will fail big. So what? You know, what if it works? If it works, we win big. So let's go with that. Uh, you know, there's some things happening even now in the television stuff. I can't tell you about right now, but it, I'm telling you, God is doing some stuff. It's amazing. And, you know, get ready for it. You're going to be seeing it. You're going to be hearing about it. But it's because we take a chance. There's always a risk involved in faith. If there's no risk, there's no faith. 
If it's not impossible, God hadn't got involved yet. Right? When it gets impossible, that's when he shows up. And we well, see, we want to make it easy on God. That's not what Elijah did. Elijah didn't make it easy. He made it hard. He did everything he could to make it where it was impossible. Isn't that right? Prophets of Baal, what did they do? They get up. He says, all right, let's see who's God. You do your thing. I'll do my thing. You go first. Why? See, whenever you know you're going to win, you don't care who goes first. Why? Because you know, go ahead. That's what Wigglesworth said. Wigglesworth did that on the ship one time. Actually, he told them the, the reverse, though. He told them, he said, they said, uh, would you like to take part in the activities, the festivities on the, church, on the, uh, on the ship? Would you like to sing a song? But believe it or not, Wigglesworth uh, couldn't, uh, he couldn't sing. <laughs> okay? And everybody talked about how he couldn't sing. And, and so he said, yes, I'll sing a song, but only if you let me go first. And they said, okay, we'll let you go first. So he got up and sang about the blood of Jesus. And guess what? That was the only thing that happened. The rest was a revival. People started getting saved, getting under conviction, getting, I mean, just amazing. He knew that. He knew, let me go first and I'll, I'll fix this up. But you have to realize what, what Elijah did was he says, I'll let you go first. You do your thing and then my God will show up. And they started doing their stuff, started yelling, shouting, doing all this stuff, dancing around, doing everything and getting louder and louder and doing it for a good period of the day. And, ke and they just shouted louder, jumped louder. And, you know, it sounds like a modern church. Yeah. Trying to get God to show up, doing everything. Then they started cutting themselves. And so <clears throat> nothing happened. And now everybody's, oh, we want the spirit of Elijah. Are you sure? <coughs> Why? Because look what the spirit of Elijah did. Elijah didn't sit over there all nice and polite. He didn't sit there, y'all go ahead. <coughs> Just, just go ahead and do your thing. He, did, he wasn't polite. He sat over there and finally he said, Hey, uh, what's the matter? Where's your God? Maybe he's gone on a long trip. Maybe he's sleeping. He even says, Maybe he's in the bathroom. You know, think about it. He was over there making fun of them. You think, Well, that's not Christian. Well, Elijah wasn't a Christian. <laughs> Right? <laughs> you know, Abraham wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile. But the Jews came out of him. Hmm. Isn't that something? Anyway, that's, something. that's a whole other thing. Right? But you need to realize, he, finally when they said, okay, we can't do it, what did he do? He said, all right, I'll, now I'm going to do my thing. And God's going to show up. But before I do my thing, here's what we're going to do. I want, you to take, I want you to dig trenches, fill it with water, Put water on everything. Put water on the altar, on the sacrifice. Put it on the wood. Soak the wood. Put it in the trenches. Make it flow like a river in the trenches. I mean, I don't want any idea that this is some kind of trick. I want this to be as impossible as it can be. He didn't make it easy on God. He made it as hard as he could. And then he said, all right, now let the fire fall. Where is God? And bam. And it not only... <clears throat> took the sacrifice, it burned up the wood, the rock, the altars, dried up all the water in it, burnt the whole thing. Now, and people say, well, I don't understand it. We did everything. Man, we played the right music. We played the same music they play at the revival. I don't get it. You know? And we, we did everything we could. And that's your problem. You're trying to make it easy on God. God, God doesn't want it easy. Amen? If it gets easy, anybody could do it. Right. See, we always say, oh, that's what we were talking about earlier. You know, we should never pray that our life is easy. We should pray to be stronger people. Amen? Why? Because that's how people know God's with you. You don't pray for an easy life. Easy, anybody can overcome an easy life. Right? You show what you can overcome. You know, you know, but nobody sets records for the least amount of weight lifted. Right? I have lifted less than anyone. I am the champion at nothing. Now think about that. That's not, there's no championship there, right? God gets involved whenever it's impossible. Make it impossible. Don't make it as easy for him. I don't need a God that shows up when everything's easy. I don't even need a God that shows up when I do everything perfect. Because if he's waiting for me to do something perfect, he'd be waiting a long time. Right? I need a God that shows up when I do everything wrong. When I'm messed up and I have messed up and I've done all that, that's when I need God. 
I mean, come on. We, we act as though God is supposed to be, well, he's just waiting there. Well, when you get it right, I'll show up. When has it ever been right? You know? And we hear, well, you know, we got to get all the strife out of the church. No strife, no disunity. we got to be in unity. Okay, show me a time when there was unity. You don't find it. Anyway, the closest was on the day of Pentecost. That's the last time you see it. Pretty much, that's it. Maybe one other time when they were praying, the place got shaken and all that kind of stuff. But as far as I hope, they were always fighting. Even in Jesus' own team. They were always fighting, right? And James and John come to Jesus and they go get their mother. Well, that doesn't seem fair, right? Jesus, let my boy sit on your left and your right. Oh, come on. You know the other disciples didn't like that. Really, James? No, you get your mom. You get your mom to ask for you. Really. What are you, five? You're, what you're gonna, we're going we're gonna to fight for a position around Jesus? I mean, that's what they were doing. Isn't that right? And then you look at, I mean, they called James and John what? The sons of thunder. Why? Because they want to call fire down from heaven and destroy a city. This is Jesus' team. You, gotta, you ever notice, if you look at the Lord's Supper, you've got Matthew here, and then you've got Simon the Zealot over here. Why? Because they couldn't get along. You had to separate them. Why? Because you got a zealot that wanted to drive out all the Romans and drive out any collaborators, and you got Matthew, who's a collaborator, on the same team. You, you know they had some discussions. Can you imagine that? You can see just Simon, the, the zealot, every time you walk by Matthew, traitor. <laughs> Jesus, he just called me a traitor. Hmm. No. Traitor. You know? you know that kind of stuff went on. Why? Because they're human. Right? Then you got... John and Peter at the resurrection, they run to the, t to the tomb, and John's writing it, and John says, we ran to the tomb. I won. I got there first. Really? You're going you're gonna to bring that kind of stuff up? And, and you know, you got doubting Thomas. I mean, here's a guy, how would you like to, here's a guy who is ready to die for Jesus. When Jesus said, we got to go back through there, and they said, man, they were trying to kill you last week. And everybody says, and Jesus says, yeah, i got to go. Thomas says, well, let's go. You know, isn't it funny? He's not remembered for that. But he's remembered because he said, oh, I'm not going to believe unless I put my hand in his side. Now, think about it. now, how would you like one event in your life to give you a nickname the last the rest of your life? Yeah. Especially if it was a bad one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But that's how all these guys were. They were all messed up. Every one of them had problems. I think that's why Jesus chose them. I don't think he was looking for, let me see who's really sharp. You got Peter, who cussed like a sailor. And they're right. I mean, he was always running his mouth off, always, you know, shooting his mouth off and trying to be the, 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 the important guy there. And he's the first one to jump out of a boat, but he did get to walk on water. Maybe it's just a couple of steps, but he did it. Nobody else in the boat could say that. You know, you know they were all saying, why'd you doubt, Peter? He said, why didn't you walk? <laughs> right? You, so you got this, this team of people that are messed up. And I'm sure Jesus, Jesus looked at them and said, yeah, you'll do. Yeah, I need you. Oh, not them. They're messed up. Exactly. Because if I can use them, maybe it'll give hope to everybody else. Right? You know that everybody else was looking at them because they, they saw they were ignorant and unlearned men. Right? But they took note. They'd been with Jesus. Everybody else was looking down on them. Everybody else was looking at these guys like, why would he choose them? And yet, that's who Jesus chose. And, and think about that. So if God will use them, he'll use you. Isn't that right? Really, all he's waiting on is for you to make a choice. Make that decision. A decision you won't back off of. That's, that's the big thing. And to do that, you just got to make it public. You make secret decisions, you'll back off of them. But <clears throat> faith is a choice. I, I've even said it before from... Uh, Joshua chapter 1, faith is courage. That, it's, uh, that's all it is. <clears throat> you, really, you see all these people in Hebrews 11, they're all people of faith. But you go back in the Old Testament, you don't see faith mentioned in any one of their lives. You just see how they lived. They didn't talk faith, they lived faith. Jesus said, when he returns, shall the Son of Man find faith on the earth? Not too sure. I know he's going to find a whole bunch of books and CDs about faith. But is he going to find faith in people? Because that's what he's looking for. He wants us to have faith in him, just to trust him. And yet we're, we act like it's so hard. It's only hard to believe a liar. It's not hard to believe the truth. Amen? This is, 
This is who you are inside. You're already connected to him. One of the things that I, I love about this, and these are some of the practices that you can do, you get near somebody with a... Okay, first off, you have all of the five-fold ministry DNA in you. Okay? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, all that's in you already. Now, you may have a different gifting or blending, and you may be more of one thing than another, but you have still that blending in you because you have Jesus, and he was all five of those. So you have that in you. And the thing is, when you get around somebody that's apostolic, you get apostolic. And by apostolic, I don't mean how you baptize people. Right? I'm talking about how you live. I'm talking about the, the, the apostolic ministry is a go ministry. It's a militant ministry. It's an aggressive ministry. Why? Because it looks at lands that have not yet been submitted to Jesus and it's determined to make them submit. And so it's always looking. Very seldom, if you have an apostolic pastor, he's hardly ever talking to the church here. He's talking to the church around the world because that's what he sees. <clears throat> if, but you, you can be apostolic or, or even if, and if you get around an apostle, then that gets stirred up in you. If you get, but if you get around uh, a, pro, a prophet or, yeah, let's just say a prophet or a prophetic people, that gets stirred up and all of a sudden you'll start prophesying just because you get around them. Why? It's like tuning forks. You get tuning forks when you have the same tone. You hit one, put it near it, and you don't have to touch it. It'll start vibrating. It's the same thing. And in you, you have the, the prophetic in you because you have the same spirit that's in the prophet, even if you're not a prophet. But you can begin to prophesy. So you get around. Whenever I get around, there are certain people, friends of mine, that when I get around them, it's, man, I, all of a sudden, it, it just starts to work. I'll begin prophesying and knowing stuff and all kinds of stuff, and that's why I love being around them. And when I get away from them, it'll start to die down, but I can stir it back up and keep it stirred up. <clears throat> but it's easy when you're around them because they keep you stirred up. And it's the same thing. You have an evangelist come in, he, he gets you to wanting to evangelize. So this is already in you, right? And, all, and that's why we need the five-fold ministry coming into every fellowship so that all of those things can be developed because if you're missing any of them, you won't be like Jesus. Jesus was an apostle. He's a great apostle. He was the prophet. He was an evangelist. He was a pastor, a shepherd. He was also the teacher, the rabbi. So all of that's in there, and it's all in you. And you need to be well-rounded in each one of those areas. Actually, we did a teaching. I don't know if we have it out in the books or not, but it's called Apostolic Alignment. And it talks about how these blendings work together and how to determine who you are and what you walk in. But the main thing is not about, well, I've got to find my gift. No, you don't. Your goal is to look like Jesus. And so the key is to be moving toward him. In that process, you will find that you function more in some areas than you do you know, better in some areas than you do the others. The tendency is to practice the areas you're good at and to ignore the weaknesses. But wisdom says find the weaknesses and practice those while you're doing the strengths and then all of a sudden the weaknesses will become equal to the strengths and now you're well rounded all the way around. Now when we talk about walking as sons of God now we're talking about a whole nother not a level of, of, of living necessarily but living out what we've been talking about so far because when you're talking about manifesting as a son of God now you're talking about actually stepping out into areas that you've not stepped out in before and functioning the way Jesus did. So at some point, <clears throat> there has to be the, the um, in you, the willingness to take that chance. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, that's actually pretty good. <clears throat> and I don't like water, but anyway. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Can't drink Coke up here though because they don't sponsor me. So, yeah, that's it. <clears throat> <clears throat> I tell you though, if I ever get them to send me a tithe check, we'll be set and never have to take up another offering. Amen? Amen? So, <clears throat> you'd think I have stock in them, but I don't. You would think so. And Walmart too, as though you would think it would be there. Anyway, <clears throat> we talk about them all over the world. So, they ought to do something, right? <laughs> but, <clears throat> but the purpose, it, it does not say in Ephesians that these fivefold ministries, that these ministries we talked about, 
that they are here <clears throat> to allow you to just be a normal Christian. It says they were given to equip you and until you grow up into him in all things. So the real purpose, the real point of this new creation, this new man, is finding out who you are, what you have, and starting to walk it out. But you have to start somewhere, and that means you're going to have to step over the line into something that you've never done before. I don't care what job you have. I don't care how good a training you've had. <clears throat> the first day of your new job, you're acting like an employee. You may be getting paid, but you're not an employee yet because you're not doing a job. You're watching, you're making mistakes, you're trying not, really you're not even worried about doing the job, you're just trying to not make a mistake and draw attention to yourself. And you're acting like an employee until you figure out what to do. It's the same thing with being a son of God. You just step out, you have to step into an area of discomfort. An area, if you're going to grow, you have to do things you don't want to do. And you have to do them until you want to do them. Right? And you develop that habit. The Bible says to exercise yourself unto godliness. Exercise. That means consistent discipline to do something over and over and over until you get it right. So as Christians, we are to exercise ourselves until we can manifest as sons of God. Because the world is waiting. It's waiting for us to be who we are. Amen? Amen? <clears throat> Things are to happen because we are there. And they are, there are things that are not happen just because we're there. You know, we always talk about um, in Acts, Uticus. Remember he was upstairs and he, Paul preached deep into the night and he fell and was, yeah. apparently died and then he was raised. And see, people always talk about that, but you realize <clears throat> the average person would have went home early and they'd have missed a dead raising. Why? You got to have the desire to be there. He said, well, how do I know it's going to be any good? You don't. But you go there. Why? I, I, I go to churches and visit because I want to be around Christians, because I want to fellowship with people. I want to be around it. I want to, I want to be uh, you know, in the midst of it. Even if I know I'm not going to agree with them, I can still fellowship with their spirit. I love when I go overseas. I love it because a lot of times I don't understand a word they're singing. <laughs> right? And that's better sometimes than being able to understand what they're singing. Right. But you go there, but you can still get the Spirit. And you can be there, and you can, you can sense the Spirit of God there, even if you can't understand what they're saying. Why? Because it passes knowledge. It's that Spirit that connects us all together. But if you're going to do things you've never done before, you've got to do things you've never done before. Amen? This is, it's really simple, and, and really the main thing we have to do is get over the fear of trying something. And, and that's why I tell everybody, if you really want to be who you are, get away from where you live. Drive, you know, an hour in each direction, you know, some direction, and get out on the street somewhere and then go act like you know, you know, act like the person you know you ought to be. Walk up to anybody, pray for, you know, if you're just afraid to do it where you are. Because Abraham, he had to leave where he was at, right? Most people have to leave where they're at. To really walk in, because there's too many people that remember them. And I don't know of hardly anybody that ever really walks in the power of God really, I mean, strongly, consistently, that didn't move somewhere else to do it. Almost every time. Or at least stepping out there or something and getting away from it and then going back to it. That's possible. But there has to come a point where you're willing to try everything and you're willing to give up everything for it. How bad do you want it? You know, it's a, the old story about the kid that wanted to, was with the guy that was, the, you know, the rich guy that had, was a total success and he wanted to have success. And he said, I want to find out the secret to success. And the old man said, okay, well, good, let's go fishing. And they go out and they sit on the side of the deal and they're sitting there. And the young boy, you know, he's, he doesn't care a bit about fishing. He's just sitting there and he just wants the secret. And he says, well, what's the secret? Tell me the secret. What's the secret? What's the secret to success? And the old man didn't say a word. He just kept sitting there, and the boy kept getting more and more agitated. And finally, the old man just reaches over, grabs the boy, and shoves him in the water, holds his head in the water. The boy starts flopping around, moving his arms, bubbles coming out, and the man keeps waiting until the bubbles stop. And all of a sudden, he jerks his head out, and the kid, Are you crazy? Why'd you do that? And the old man said, You want the secret to success? 
when you want success as bad as you want that, wanted that next breath, you'll have it. Well, when you want God in your life to the degree that you say you do, more than you want your next breath, you'll have it. Why? Because you'll do what it takes to make it happen. But it's all about grace. Okay, let's clear this up real quick. You want to know what's by grace? You getting in the family is by grace. You get that? And because by his grace you got in there, now we get to show him our appreciation by how we live. Right? And I'm not saying that you don't say when I lay hands on the sick and they get healed, that's by grace. Why? Because there's nothing I, I'm not doing to make it happen. I get used by God by grace. It's grace that allows him to use me. It's grace that allows him to get healed. You got that? Yes. <clears throat> but at the same time, if, it, if we have nothing to do with it, then why isn't he using everybody? We've got something to do with it. He, he wants our wills united with his will. And the bad part is, most people nowadays don't have much of a will. They fly in the wind back and forth, to and fro, with every wind of doctrine. And they don't have the grit to say, you know what, this is right. Well, 99% of the Christians don't like it. Too bad. Right? 99% of the Christians aren't being used by God. You have to make that decision. And then don't back off and keep moving forward and keep doing what is right. No matter what. No matter what anybody says. Amen? Because this is your destiny. This, is, this was prominent. When Jesus said in Mark 16, believers lay hands on the sick and they, uh, they recover, he was prophesying about you. He wasn't talking about those 11. He was prophesying about you. In Matthew 28, he said the same thing. You go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. <clears throat> those that believe and are baptized will be saved. Those that don't believe, they'll be damned. You know, right? Then he said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Them, not you guys. He wasn't talking to the 11. He was talking about the generation that they were going to convert. So he was prophesying that. <clears throat> they had already seen those signs. They didn't need the promise of signs. They'd already seen that stuff. He said, but these same signs you've, you've seen, they're going to do. Why? And he said, and you keep doing this, and you teach them to do, obey, observe, and do everything I've commanded you. In other words, everything I taught you, you teach them. Everything I told you to do, you tell them to do. And tell them to teach their followers everything and to do everything. And this should be passed right on down for 2,000 years now. But it was dropped somewhere along the way. And now it's time to pick it back up and run with it full bore. I mean, just all out. Amen? <clears throat> I don't know about you. You know, I've, I've been doing this now. I've been studying the Bible really all my life. <clears throat> but walking this out. Uh, you know, was studying it for 30, you know, 20, 30 years. <clears throat> Been walking it now and at least for the last 20, 30 years full time. And, and, and we're seeing it happen. And the, like I said the other day, the only regret I have is I didn't start sooner. What I know today, not by experience, but what I, the doctrinal aspect of what I know, I knew 20 years before I was actually doing it. And you know what held me back? Everybody telling me I was wrong. And I wasn't sure. I kept thinking, well, if everybody's saying that, I mean, how, how can I be right if it's everybody said? And it took me almost, almost 20 years to decide, you know what? I'm not going to turn 70 sitting on my front porch in a rocking chair wondering what if I had actually stepped out. I decided I'm going to do this no matter what. Go big, fail big, win big, whatever it is, it's going to happen. And if this is true, it's going to work and I'm going to live the rest of my life with it. And if it's not, I'll trash it. You know, I could always go back to teaching martial arts. That, that was my idea. And I said, but I know God is true. I knew he spared my life. I knew he healed me. I'd seen what he'd done in our family. But I said, this stuff has to be true. It has to be. Why? Because I'm just reading the Bible. I'm not going by man's opinion. I'm just reading. The there were things that Dr. Lake said in his writings that helped me. You know, one of the biggest things that helped me wasn't even in his writings. Isn't that something? You know where I read it? In a newspaper clipping. One of the, one of the, one of the major things for me. <laughs> It, he gave a, a, in, in a newspaper clipping, he told the story about this man that came to him with a crutch. And he came in his office and this man said, what can you do for me? He said, I don't have faith in God. I don't have faith in man. I don't have faith in anything. I don't, have, I don't even have faith in you. 
Now think about that. Think of somebody walking into your office telling you, I'm crippled and I got no faith in any of that. I don't even know why I'm here. And this man says, now what can you do for me? Most preachers would have said, not a thing. Bye. But Lake wasn't like that. You know what he said? He said, come on here and sit down. He said, that's okay. I got enough faith for both of us. And I read that. And he said, while he stood there, he let this man talk about how he doesn't have faith. And the whole time he's standing with his hand on his shoulder. In a few minutes, he reached over and took that crutch. And the man's talking. Hmm, yeah, do tell. Wow, that's amazing. And put the crutch over there and just set it, set it aside. And then still talking to this man. And he said, well, now you have a good day. Now go on your way. And the man said, well, all right. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go on out of here. And he, said, and he walked out of the room, got out in the hallway. And Lake said, uh, do you want this? And the man looked. Now, I'm going to quote what the man said. Don't get mad at me. That's what the man said. The man looked at that crutch and said, ah, to hell with it. <laughs> well, he was right. <laughs> okay. The man not have been religious, but he was right. But now think about that. And when I read that in a newspaper clipping, I realized we can have faith for others. And then I, that sent me to the Bible. And I started reading through the Bible. And I go, wow, the Roman centurion had faith for a servant. The Syrophoenician woman had faith for a daughter. All these people had faith for other people. And I thought, if they could, we could. They weren't even born again. Roman centurion was a Gentile. He wasn't even born again. If, if they could have faith for people, why can't we? We're Christians. We already have faith in God. Why can't we have faith for other people? And I just kept searching it out and realizing we can. We should. And so then we started teaching. Them. Oh, that's almost heresy. Well, if, we can have faith, if you cannot have faith for other people, then do not go into intercessory prayer. Because that's what you're doing. You're standing in the gap for them. If you can't stand in the gap for them, you can't pray for them, you can't do anything. It's, it's all prayers a waste for anybody else except yourself. So I started looking at all this stuff and, and just kept preaching it. Got asked to leave a lot of churches. I mean, asked to leave. They were glad when I left. You know, they loved it when I got there because I could talk Pentecostal history and we could talk this stuff. And oh man, they love this. And I was their resident, you know, Pentecostal historian and and then, but then I started asking questions. What about this? Why do you do this? Why do you do this when the Bible says that? Well, you know, we, 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 just, we think you might be happier somewhere else. I think I might be. You know? I mean, that's all that kind of stuff. You know? Then I found one pastor that was, had enough guts to give me a chance and had me. I, I told him, I said, I, I want to teach a Bible. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. He said, I, that's what. I teach a Bible doctrine class. Fine, do it. And that's where we saw this Sudafed anointing and all that kind of stuff. You don't, you don't know what I'm talking about, but we saw God do some things. But it was my, I got more educated out of that than anybody I was teaching because I learned some things and saw some things. And, it, and, and then I thought, wow, if that's true, then that must be true. And, and then it just began to grow. And then we started getting the materials from Dr. Lake and, or from Wilford and Gertrude and just started reading it. I'm like, yeah, this matches this spirit of dominion that, that Jesus had, it matches everything I'm reading here. But it goes against everything I've been taught. And so I had to make a decision. Do I buck the system and stay with the Bible? Or do I just become a nice little preacher somewhere pastoring and everybody says, okay, well, uh, who is that again? Because, you know, he's, he's not making many waves. Right? right? I don't, you know, people say, well, don't rock the boat. I'm not trying to rock it. I'm trying to sink it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's kill those sacred cows and let's get on with real life. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, I got to, I got to, it's five o'clock. I got to, I got to stop now. We're going to be, we come back here tonight at seven. Is that what we're doing? Okay. I hadn't even looked. Okay. All right. Well, we will do that tonight. All right. All right. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. If you are considering partnering with us and would like to support our mission, please visit jglm.org forward slash partners. Proceeds will go toward the cost of the television broadcast and our mission work around the world.